Are you ready to learn the most overpowered integration technique there is? It's called Feynman's trick because he's the guy who helped to popularize it. Try to evaluate this integral. You might try substitutions, integration by parts, even trig identities. Try as you might, you will never, ever, ever be able to find an antiderivative to solve this problem. I might make a video explaining why at some point in the future, so let me know if you'd want to see that. This integral evaluates to a number. Whilst we can't work out what that number is by using the typical method of finding an antiderivative, we can find an answer by using Feynman's trick. Let's see how. We introduce an alpha into the integral. There are many different ways in which we can do this. We just need to be intelligent enough to figure out which way is going to work. The value of the integral now depends on alpha. For a different value of alpha, you'll get a different number. It's a function of alpha, which we call i of alpha. And what we care about in this case is finding i of 1, as that was our original problem. The idea is that we're going to differentiate with respect to alpha, which will give us a function which will hopefully be able to integrate with respect to x. Before I show you, I want to make it crystal clear what we're about to do. We're going to differentiate sine alpha x over x with respect to alpha, meaning we're treating x as though it's a constant. The derivative of sine is cos, so we replace sine of alpha x with cos of alpha x. We then use the chain rule and multiply by the derivative of alpha x with respect to alpha, which is x. In this example, the x's cancel very nicely. This is indeed a function which we know how to integrate. The trick worked. Well, not so fast. We need to actually do the integral now. We're integrating with respect to x, meaning we're treating alpha as a constant. The integral of cosine is sine, and we divide by alpha. The only thing left to do is to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. When x is zero, the inside becomes zero. When x goes to infinity, the inside... Oh. Oh dear. The inside does not converge. Sine of alpha x will oscillate between negative one and one, and negative one and one, forever. So Feynman's trick has failed us. I know, I know, this is very disappointing, but... I really wasn't lying when I said that Feynman's trick is OP. We just need to apply it in a more intelligent way. The previous attempt failed, so we'll try again using a different choice of where to put alpha. When alpha is 0, we have our original problem, because e to the 0 is 1, so our goal has now become to find i is 0. This might seem like a strange choice of i of alpha. The reason for using e to the alpha x is that when we differentiate it with respect to alpha, we introduce a factor of x, which will cancel the x in the denominator. It also ensures that i prime of alpha actually converges. The problem with our first attempt was that it didn't. This choice should circumvent that problem. We proceed by differentiating with respect to alpha. We're treating x as a constant, so sine x over x is constant and is unaffected. The derivative of e to the alpha x is x e to the alpha x, which is what we have here. The x's cancel. And we get this. Remember, the key idea of Feynman's trick is that once we've differentiated with respect to alpha, we want to have a function which we know how to integrate with respect to x. Has it worked this time? Can we integrate this with respect to x? Well, as long as alpha is negative, this integral will converge, since e to the alpha x will become incredibly small for large x. As long as you make sure to remember that alpha is negative, we won't encounter the same problem we had before, which was that the integral diverged. Which is good, but that's a different question from, can we actually evaluate this integral? Using integration by parts, it actually isn't too bad. If you don't know integration by parts, just roll with it for now. If you do, then follow along. I like to use the DI method for integration by parts, as it makes it easy to set out. We start with two columns, D and I. We choose which function to differentiate, and write it in the D column. We then choose the other function to integrate, and write it in the I column. 
In this case, it doesn't matter which way around you choose, both will get you to the right answer in the end. There's a third column on the left, with alternating plus and minus, which is because of how repeated integration by parts works. We differentiate the D column and integrate the I column, and check if we know how to integrate the new row. The new row we have here is negative alpha e to the alpha x times negative cos x, which is alpha cos x e to the alpha x. We don't know how to integrate this, so keep going. Differentiating the D column and integrating the I column again, the next row is alpha squared e to the alpha x times negative sine x, which is negative alpha squared sine x e to the alpha x. We still don't know how to integrate this, but we can stop here because this is a constant multiple of sine x e to the alpha x, which is what we were trying to integrate at the top. This means we'll be able to form an equation involving i prime of alpha, which we can then rearrange to find i prime of alpha. You'll see what I mean in a moment. The next step in integration by parts is to multiply along the diagonals. e to the alpha x times negative cos x is negative cos x e to the alpha x. For the upper bound of the integral, what happens as x goes to infinity? Remember that alpha is negative, so when x goes to infinity, this goes to zero. For the lower bound of the integral, what does this become at x equals zero? It'll be negative one. So this term will be zero minus minus one, which is one. The next diagonal is negative alpha e to the alpha x times negative sine x, which is alpha sine x e to the alpha x. Again, we need to see what happens as x goes to infinity and at x equals zero. As x goes to infinity, we get zero, and at x equals zero, we get zero. So this term will be zero. Finally, we need the integral of the bottom row. This will be negative alpha squared times the integral from zero to infinity of sine x e to the alpha x dx, which is just negative alpha squared times the thing at the top, or negative alpha squared i prime alpha. Adding these terms together, the integration by parts is now complete. We have a very simple equation which we can easily rearrange for i prime of alpha. Let's not lose track of where we're going. We want to evaluate our original integral, which happens to be i over zero. We have the derivative of i of alpha. We want i of alpha, so let's integrate both sides with respect to alpha. The integral of one over one plus alpha squared, by the way, is arctan alpha. You could do this by a substitution, but this is a pretty standard result. Don't forget the plus c. It's very important here. We want to work out what this constant c is. To do this, we need to evaluate the function i of alpha at some value of alpha. Any value of alpha will do. Unfortunately, there's no value of alpha for which we know how to do this integral. We seem to be out of luck. Usually what we would do is, if possible, choose a value of alpha so that the whole thing becomes zero. We can't do that here because e to the alpha x won't be zero for any alpha. However, as alpha goes to negative infinity, which is okay because we said that alpha is negative, then e to the alpha x will go to zero since x is positive because the integral has bound zero to infinity. The limit as alpha goes to negative infinity of i of alpha is therefore zero. If I take this limit on both sides of the bottom equation, i of alpha goes to zero, and arctan of alpha goes to negative pi over two. We rearrange the bottom equation to find that c equals pi over two, and hence i of alpha equals arctan alpha plus pi over two. Finally, we're ready for i of zero. Arctan of zero is zero, so i of zero is pi over two. i of zero is the integral from zero to infinity of sine x over x dx. And so, that integral is pi over two. This is the total area of this shape where the green is positive and the red is negative. 
The truly remarkable thing about Feynman's trick is that it allows us to solve problems which would not only be difficult using standard methods, but in fact would be impossible using standard methods. This problem being an example of just that. This was just one example of using Feynman's trick to solve otherwise impossible integrals. Hopefully you learned something from this video. If you did, give the video a like, subscribe and hit the bell icon. If not, dislike the video and leave a really mean comment down below. Thanks for watching, see you next time.